Hi, welcome to the second part of This Week in Tudor History for the week beginning the 8th of February. In this second part, I'm going to be telling you about the passing of acts that allowed a king to execute his wife and to execute people showing signs of madness. I'll be talking about a miscarriage of justice, which led to a priest being executed in Queen Elizabeth I's reign. I'm going to be talking about an Elizabethan astrologer whose prophecies were, well, problematic, and a man known as William Waystall. First, I'm going to take you to the reign of King Henry VIII. On the 11th of February, 1542, the Bill of Attainder against Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, and Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, received the King's assent, given in absentia by letters patent. The Bill had been introduced into Parliament on the 21st of January, 1542, but there had been confusion about whether the Queen's offences did constitute treason. So it was postponed, read again on the 28th of January and postponed, finally receiving the King's assent on the 11th of February. Catherine had proved to have been not of pure and honest living before her marriage and had allegedly wanted to return to her old abominable life. She had also confederated with Lady Jane Rochford, widow, late wife of Sir George Boleyn, late Lord Rochford, to bring her vicious and abominable purpose to pass with Thomas Culpepper, late one of the King's Privy Chamber, who of course had already been executed with Francis Derham in December 1541. The bill also stated that the indictments of such as have lately suffered are hereby approved and the said Queen and Lady Rochford are by authority of this Parliament convicted and attainted of high treason and shall suffer accordingly. An act for due process to be had in high treason in cases of lunacy or madness also received royal assent in the House of Lords on that same day. This legislation meant that a person becoming insane after the supposed commission of treason might be tried or losing his rational faculties after attainder might be executed. Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, had displayed what was described as a fit of madness following her arrest in 1541 and had been released from the Tower of London into the care of Sir John Russell and his wife. Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, recorded how King Henry VIII had sent his own physicians to treat her, that he may afterwards have her executed as an example. However, so worried was the king that Jane would have another breakdown that he brought in this new legislation, meaning that she could still be executed even if she was still deemed to be insane. Madness could not save Lady Rochford from Henry VIII's wrath. Both women did suffer accordingly, as the Act of Attainder put it, being executed by beheading at the Tower of London on the 13th of February, 1542. Moving on to the 12th of February, the 12th of February 1584, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. And that was the day when five Catholic priests, including James Fenn, were hanged, drawn and quartered at Tyburn. Fenn was beatified by Pope Pius XI in 1929. 18th century Bishop Richard Challoner gives details of James Fenn's life in his book, Memoirs of missionary priests and other Catholics of both sexes that have suffered death in England on religious accounts from the year 1577 to 1684. He states that Fenn was from Montacute in Somerset and was educated at New College Oxford and then Corpus Christi College, from which he was expelled after refusing to take the oath of supremacy. He acted as a tutor to students of Gloucester Hall before he took up a tutoring post in his home county of Somerset. Fenn got married and had two children, but his wife then died. He then worked as a steward for a Catholic gentleman, Nicholas Points, 
in whose household he met a priest who encouraged him to use his gifts by going to the English college at Reims and then Douai to take holy orders. Fenn did that and he was ordained as a priest in 1580. He was then sent back to Somerset on a mission to bring people back to the Catholic Church, which he did. He was arrested and put in Ilchester jail and exposed, chained and fettered as he was in a public place on a market day for a show to all the people. This display backfired when his behaviour led to the spectators having a great veneration for him and many began to look more seriously into their religion. Fenn was reported to Queen Elizabeth I Council, who ordered him to be sent to London. Sir Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's spymaster, interrogated him, and he was imprisoned in the Marshalsea for two years. It was not known at this point that he was a priest, so he was allowed visitors. Fenn used these visits to minister to people and convert Protestants to what he viewed as the true faith. He also encouraged his fellow visitors to repent of their crimes and embrace their faith. It was eventually discovered that he was a priest and he was examined concerning the supremacy. Fenn declared that he was willing to lay down his life for his Catholic beliefs. He was tried and accused of conspiring with George Haydock at Rome to return to England and kill the Queen. Fenn declared his innocence and stated that he was in England at the time that it was alleged that he was plotting in Rome, that he'd actually been imprisoned at the Marshalsea at the time. He affirmed that he would never hurt the Queen. His words fell on deaf ears. The judge stated that even though there'd been mistakes made with the time and place, that it was still sufficient to convict of treason. He then instructed the jury to find Fenn guilty, which they did, and he was condemned to death. Fenn was then taken to the Tower of London, where he was kept in irons until the day of his execution. His former schoolfellow, a Mr Popham, who was the Attorney General, tried to convince him to comply so that he could attempt to save his life, but Fenn was ready to die for his faith. On the 12th of February 1584, Fenn was drawn on a hurdle to Tyburn. Chaloner writes of how it was a moving spectacle to see Fenn's little girl, Frances, weeping as she said a final farewell to her father, while he looked upon her with a calm and serene countenance and gave her a blessing. At Tyburn, Fenn prayed, declared his innocence, and then recommended himself and the Queen to whom he wished all manner of happiness, to God's mercy. He was then hanged, cut down while he was still alive, disemboweled and quartered. His head was put on display on London Bridge, while the quarters of his body were placed on four of the city's gates. The other priests executed on that day were George Haydock, Thomas Hemmerford, John Nutter and John Munden. Moving on to the 13th of February, On the 13th of February, 1564, also in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, astrologer and physician John Harvey was baptised at Saffron Walden in Essex. Harvey was the third son of farmer and rope maker John Harvey and his wife Alice. His brothers were renowned scholar Gabriel Harvey and astrologer and theologian Richard Harvey. After a Cambridge education, Harvey worked as a tutor in the household of Justice Thomas Mead and was recorded as stealing away Mead's daughter, Martha, whom he married in 1583. He went on to practice medicine in Kings Lynn in Norfolk and died there in 1592 when he was just 28 years old. He was survived by his wife and two little girls. Harvey's published works included the 1583 An Astrological Edition, which he dedicated to his father-in-law, a series of almanacs which were dedicated to his father-in-law, Lord Chancellor Sir Thomas Bromley and Lord Chancellor Sir Christopher Hatton, and the 1588 A Discoursive Problem Concerning Prophecies. The 1583 work wasn't a standalone work. It was written as a supplement to his brother Richard's work, Astrological Discourse, which was about the 1583 Great Conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. 
Unfortunately, as John Harvey's biographer Bernard Cap notes, the publication of the books, which included prophecies of apocalyptic events, led to John and Richard being ridiculed due to the failure of their prophecies. Oh dear. Finally, on the 14th of February, 1492, in the reign of King Henry VII, magnate William Barclay, Marquis of Barclay, died. He was buried in the Augustinian Friary in London with his second wife, Joan. Barclay is known for his involvement in the 1470 Battle of Nibley Green, the last English battle fought between private armies of feudal magnates. The Barclays and the Talbots had a feud over the Barclay title and estates, and this came to a head when Thomas Talbot, second Viscount Lyle, challenged William Barclay to battle. Barclay accepted, and the two men and their private armies clashed at Nibley Green in Gloucestershire. Barclay's force, which far outnumbered Lyle's, defeated Lyle, and Lyle was killed. Quite an accomplishment. Yet the family historian, John Smith of Nibley, in the 17th century, called Barclay William the Wassall, or William the Wastall. Oh dear, why? Well, in 1476, he'd surrendered his reversionary rights to the Mowbray inheritance to Prince Richard, son of King Edward IV. Then, following King Henry VII's accession to the throne, Barclay used the Barclay lands to buy advancement, granting lands to William Stanley and even granting King Henry VII the reversion of Barclay Castle if Barclay were to die without a surviving male heir, which he did on the 14th of February 1492. Historian Rosemary Horrocks writes, only with the end of the male Tudor line at the death of Edward VI were the Barclays able to regain some of their alienated estates. At least they did, though. Oh, and 14th of February is, of course, Valentine's Day. Was it celebrated in Tudor times? Well, yes. I'll share a link in the description to Teasel's Tudor trivia video on it so that you can find out all about it, what medieval people and Tudor people did on the 14th of February. Thank you for joining me today. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking round about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live and you can give me a like and leave me a comment. Thank you. Bye bye.